give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls to another Give us clean hands, oh God Give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls Let us not lift our souls Welcome to First Christian Church, Ashland, Ohio On a beautiful, beautiful summer morning Oh my goodness, thank you for coming out. What a great crowd this is too. We had no idea how many would show up and this is, this is fabulous, just fabulous. So I'm glad you've come and I know it's not just to get outside, but it's here to be together and to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I have a few announcements. I was gonna say, boy, we need a lot of baby bottles back. We've got an awful lot coming back already. I'd like to have them all back if we could right around uh, July 12th. That'll give you a couple of weeks yet. Um, to get yours filled up if it's not already and bring just bring it at service or drop it off at the church sometime and uh, Just wanted to say that uh, Ella Strine is doing exceptionally well if you haven't seen and heard um, Her surgery was great. There, there you are 99.9% .9 certain that all the cancer has been um, Is now gone her leg has a new bone in it. Uh, there's just some fabulous things going Arlene has been doing extremely well too. The doctors are very pleased at all the things that are happening with her too. So I wanted you to know that God and your prayers are working tremendously in, in those two. Absolutely. Praise the Lord on that. Now, um, starting July 9th, here at the pavilion, and if the weather is bad, it'll be in, in our one Sunday our one classroom in there. Um, hospice, Pathways Hospice, will be having a bereavement um, uh, meeting, a group meeting here. And it'll go for six weeks. It'll be on every Thursday starting the 9th at 1 o'clock to about 2.30 or so. I plan on being here, and I know a few other folks are too. So if you know someone or if you would like to just kind of help because of all of the extra strain and stress that we've been over the last few months too, I think it would be a, a very good thing to do to come and to share with each other. So just wanted you to be aware that's coming up. Um, if you notice, the tables are a little different color too. They have been stained, and we want to thank the Hastings girls for staining those tables for us. Yay. And the Hastings, so I think uh, just a quick yes, thank you so much. It was done, um, wasn't it, was it last fall or early spring? Last fall, <laughs> this is the first time we've been able to use them. So it's great, and we thank you for that. And speaking of the Hastings girls, there will be on July 25th, from two to six, they will be having a, the, be a, from their graduation, there'll be a celebration and a party and a picnic at the Hastings House, which is on Southview Drive. And uh, there will, this will be on Facebook and on our website, too, if that's all right. And so you're all invited to come to the party. And I, it will be a great party, and we thank you for that. And congratulations again. Let's uh, hear this call to worship. Sing to the Lord, all of the earth. Tell of God's salvation from day to day, and including today. Declare God's glory among all of the nations. And may the Creator's marvelous works among all of the peoples show in our faces and in our deeds each day. For great is the Lord, and great is He to be praised. May we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a glorious day and a time that we can come together and praise you and glorify you and raise your voice among uh, raise our voices to you, that your name is above all names. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise and glorify you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Today is um, Father's Day, and I thought I would just say a couple of words. <clears throat> We've had a Mother's Day. We celebrate mothers. We celebrate fathers. Sometimes I think we categorize those a little bit too much. I think we talked about that a little bit about Mother's Day, too. But to get a little personal about it, my father, as you all know, passed away when I was very young. I was so fortunate that my mother, who was my wonderful mother, also took up the role of father. And then through my life, at those critical times, I look back over my life, at critical times, there was always somebody there that picked up that slack, that, that took me by the hand and said, maybe you shouldn't do this, but let's go here and do that. Um, there was just these, I, I can go back and I can tell you each person. We are all 
these fathers is really what it amounts to. It's how we act and interact with those around us, whether they're a, a young man or a young woman or an older person. It doesn't matter. We are those fathers that help, that guide, that show how God wants us to live and to interact with each other. So we celebrate all fathers, but we celebrate every person who also is a mentor, a guide, someone who helps someone else. Because see, that's the whole Christian way too. We help others, whether they're in trouble or whether they're just our neighbor and we're having a party with them. That's who we are. And it's who Jesus instructs us to be. And I'm so grateful that we are who we are to help others find their way home too, to heaven. Ellie? Good morning. Good morning. The scripture this morning is Romans 1 through 11. <clears throat> Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we <clears throat> were baptized, therefore we were buried with him by baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Since a person who has died is freed from sin, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, because we know that Christ, having been raised from the bread, dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Word of the Lord. Uh, do we have any uh, prayer concerns this morning or praises? Ellie, yeah. Yeah. people from the South have really appreciated our minister of Rich for being on the internet. Galloway, who is now over in Mansfield at a nursing uh, facility, um, just trying to get stronger, I guess. She's still having a rough time. Um, and also there's a card for Kohler Scott. That's uh, Jim and Dana's grandson. It's his birthday this week, and he, he knows he can't have a party, so he's hoping for cards. So I thought we'd send him one from the church. And it's up here if it, people will please sign. Okay. If I don't lose everything. <clears throat> we gather this morning, Heavenly Father, for the first time in months, in the beauty of your creation, and we thank you. We have missed this fellowship. We pray for those who are unable to be with us. We pray for those who are at risk, and we pray for those who are living in some fear. Today, as we observe Father's Day, we lift up all fathers with adoration and love. For some of us, we just must remember the love of our fathers. For others, they enjoy the love given to them every day. Fathers play such an important role in the lives of our children as mentors, providers, caregivers, and so much more. Thank you for showering them with your blessing. We pray that you would guide them and help them to live their lives so their children might see Christ in them. As we venture forth with the 
coronavirus still with us. We ask for your guidance. Help us not to live our lives in fear, but to be careful in all we do. Keep us in your tender care. Keep us safe. Surround us with your love. You will get us through this. We ask now for blessing and healing power on those friends uh, and members that would need our prayers. We, we pray again for Ellis Drine and for Arlene Whitmer, and we pray for Marcia Galloway. And, and we thank you for the praise for our pastor who has filled in so well all of, for online services, and we thank him. We also pray for those who are lost and can't find their way. We pray for those who are misjudged and misunderstood. We remember thou, now those in our lives who need to know you better. Speak to us in our silence. We know that during this tor turmoil in our lives, with all the news that is so scary, Help us to choose to live in peace and joy and not be caught up in all the darkness that is keeping us from trusting you. You will get us through this. We ask for your forgiveness when we fall short. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Ellie. One, one other thank. I would like to offer, and I it's just I want to thank Brian. I know he's just sitting there shaking his head, no, 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 but yes, Brian. Uh, Brian made us look real good. He um, each week something just went better and better and better on those services, and he really did. Um, he did a wonderful job, and I, I thank you, thank you your love and devotion. It was funny, L.A. mentioned the word fear. We hate that word, I'm afraid. I know I do. I'm trying to find a place to put my music so it doesn't blow away. I remember when I was about 11, 12 years old, the movie Godzilla was out. I'm sure some of us remember that. My mom let my brother and I go down to the movie theater to see Godzilla. And it was getting dark when the movie was over. And I remember having to walk home all the way back down to Ashland Avenue. And um, I remember walking down Maple Street. And I could take you to the house. <laughs> As I was walking by the house, and all of a sudden, I knew if I looked up, through the tree and over the house, Godzilla would be standing there, ready to pounce. Um, <laughs> it, it's never quite left me, not that I'm a scaredy cat, but I am a scaredy cat. Back in the 70s, we were, we were living in, in Lancaster, and Donita and I, one evening, um, I think it was just before Tori was born or something, we went to the drive-in theater. I had this clunky little Volkswagen Beetle. And here we're sitting in this little bitty car, and the second movie on was called The Legend of Boggy Creek. And which is, um, <laughs> to this day, I can't go in my backyard, <laughs> but it's too dark. Uh, something about, and I know, I, 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 and I've said this to Donita, someday I'm going to be in the woods, and Bigfoot's going to be there going, remember me? Um, so that's why I don't go to the woods anymore. <laughs> <laughs> fear. That's what I want to talk about. Ellie had mentioned the word fear in her prayer. Fear. We've had a lot of fear, haven't we? But we are born into fear, if you think about it. We're, we're, we're taught from an early age, you have to fear strangers. We fear hunger. We fear darkness. 
We fear the Boggy Creek monster. We, we fear all kinds of things. And then even in the world, what happens to, for us to stay in line, we're told to toe the line or else, right? We, we, we've all heard that. I mean, um, even our fathers <laughs> inflicted a little fear on us to keep us on the straight and narrow. But fear is one of those things that really comes at us. So, if I was to bring this out and put it underneath your nose, does that make you a little, have a little fear? Are you afraid if I would come out and ask you to say something? So I'm not going to do that, but this is fear. <laughs> but what I'm going to do for the next, sounds like thunder, doesn't it? Yeah. For the next couple of minutes, I want you all to tell me what you're afraid of. Just shout something out. Spiders. 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 <laughs> Snakes. Snakes. Mice. Mice? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some people fear going to church. Fear going to church. All right. Thank you, Kent. We've just turned the we've just turned the corner, and that's where I wanted to go. What else? Accidents. Accidents. Rejection. Rejection. Ooh. Death. Death. Fear of the government. Fear of the government. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown. Wow, this list goes on and on, doesn't it? Thank you for uh, for bringing up a few of those things. You know, speaking out is one of those things that we're maybe fear. Might say something silly, huh? Might say something that somebody take offense of, huh? You might just say something that makes somebody else feel bad. And like Kent says, maybe just coming here, there's a lot of people out there now that are afraid to go to a church. They don't know what to expect. They think maybe we're different people than them. And we're not, are we? We're really not. A couple of you said it though, the very most, the very most, there's great grammar, isn't it? The most powerful fear, I think, out there is fear of violence and fear of death. I think those two really, I think they would top the list. Now our scripture today that I'm going to read in a few moments, Jesus sees fear, and he knows that fear can cause his disciples to not go and do what he's just asked them to do. Okay? He's asked them to leave home. He's asked them to leave their family. He's asked them to go out and do public speaking. And I know most people don't like to do public speaking. They know, there's, Jesus knows they're going to be up against ridicule. They're going to be up against people that may strike out at them. But what Jesus is doing here, and this is what we started talking about last week, this is like a job interview that Jesus was telling the disciples. And I think he's telling us too, and I'll get around to that in a moment. But normally when you go to a job interview, you're sitting there and, 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 and let's say you've, you've um, worked it all out where you've gone through all of the classes and now you can be a teacher and now you're talking to, to, the, to whoever it is that hires you to become a teacher. And what do they do? They usually tell you all of the good things about the job, do they? Don't they? This is, these are the benefits, these are how, and these are how many students, and this, and this, and this, and, and all of a sudden, you're not hearing all of the bad stuff. But the interesting thing about Jesus telling the disciples what they're going to be up against, he tells them all the bad stuff. I mean, that's just not the kind of interview I think I'd want to go to. So listen to some of these words. I'm going to recap first, just so we know where we're at. Jesus sends out the 12. That's what we talked about last week. 
And when he, when he sends them out, he says, don't take anything with you, don't take any food, don't take any money, don't take uh, an extra set of clothes, not even a set of uh, new shoes or anything, just go. And then he says, when you go into a town, of course, he sends them out to what he called the lost sheep of Israel. Now, I know I said something about that last week, but I'm going to reiterate that today. The lost sheep of Israel are in Ashland, Ohio times, there are 80% of the people that we live next door to. You see, we're all familiar with living in Ashland, but we're not familiar with one another. The ones that don't go to church are the lost the lost people of Ashland. Okay, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing what Jesus is saying, but that's exactly what Jesus was telling the disciples. Go to the people that you, you, you at least you have something in common with. He said, go to the, the other Jewish people and that way it'll give you something solid to be able to at least talk with somebody. Remember our random acts of kindness? It's that type of thing. How do you get to know somebody doing something for someone else? Not hitting them over the head with a Bible. Okay? I don't want to say that comes later, but just to get a laugh. But, so if, if you get along with somebody, stay there. If somebody gives you some grief, leave because someone else might be in God's line to come to that person, you see. We, we don't have to shirk away. But see, that's a frightening thing to go out and talk to somebody. Fear, that's what I, again, what we're talking about here. So then, Jesus went along and he says, be on your guard against men because they're going to hand you over to local council. Well, there's a happy thought, isn't it? You, you, you go out and you do some good things and you're still going to be handed over. You, you could be flogged, you could be imprisoned. He says, then also brothers are going to betray brothers, and fathers will betray fathers, and on and on it goes. A student is not, then we start with 24, and this is chapter 10, Matthew, verse 24. He starts off and he says, a student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master, you see. And what he's saying there is very simply, don't get a big head understand what I'm teaching you or what the teacher is teaching you or what your master is telling you to do but do what he says you see that's all that means and he says if the head of the house has been called Beelzebub Beelzebub is another word for Satan how much more the members of the household no more is the point he said if who you're following is being yelled at, let's say, we'll just put it in those terms, you as a person aren't going to get yelled at any more than them. And if you're doing the right thing following the master, the teacher, you're good. There's where Jesus is going with that. Fear. Is fear controlling you or something else? So he says, I love it, 26 comes along, so do not be afraid of them. Afraid of them. Do not be. Okay? There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak it from the rooftops. What is whispered in your ears, proclaim it in the daylight. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. So there's the second time in just three verses. Do not be afraid. Even if somebody comes after you, do not be afraid. These are hard words. Really hard words to understand and, and want to really believe. And if we're followers of Jesus, we've said this before, it's one of the hardest jobs we're ever have. Because we are under a different set of rules, if you will. And, and I'm going to say it again. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Because he says, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body. And who's that? That's God. If you're going to be afraid, there's only one thing you should be afraid of. And that is um, God. Not doing what God wants us to do. In other words, don't follow the world, follow what Jesus is saying. Follow God. Because He's the one that can make it make your life miserable in the hereafter. 
Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Isn't that an amazing statement? Every time I hear that, I, I just I, I really consider a number on each of a hair on the top of my head. And then we lose a few. But um, God knows every hair. He knows every bird. He knows every butterfly. He knows every blade of grass. He says, so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. For you are worth much more than sparrows, even a whole bunch of sparrows. God loves us that much more. And he loves the sparrows. He created them. You see? The world can't stand to any of that. But we with God can. So he says, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Isn't that a wonderful statement? Think about that. If you just follow what Jesus said, Jesus will sit there and he will say to God, look at him. Look at Jim. Look at Sue. Look at Mona. Look at Jim. Fill in the word. If we follow, Jesus will say a word for us to God in heaven. Wow. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. That's the flip side. So you see, Jesus is not pulling any punches here. He's not saying this is a cakewalk. He's saying, this is tough work. This is tough, but I want you to get out and I want you to do it. He says, do not suppose, and this is the, to me, this is the crown of the whole thing. It says, do not suppose that I come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace. The world is, up till the point Jesus came along, the world has just been kind of going along. And all of a sudden, Jesus came. And this is where you have to make a decision. What do you do with Jesus? We said that a couple of weeks ago, if you recall. What are you going to do with Jesus? He said, I've come not to bring peace, but in Luke he says division. In Matthew, Matthew wrote the word sword. A sword divides things. You can't sit on a fence. You have to either follow one or follow the other. You can't do a little of this and do a little of that. The world kind of teaches us to do a little of this and not a bunch of that. But it's the other way around. We have to truly follow. And then Jesus again reiterates, a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and on and on. But then he says, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. There is another tough question. Can you imagine? I love my mom. I love my wife. But if I love her more than Jesus, I'm disowned. You know, these are not happy thoughts that Jesus is bringing us, is it? If anything, we should be af afraid if we're not doing those things. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me also. And anyone who does not take his cross up and follow me is not worthy of me. In other words, if you have to, to your death, follow Jesus. Who here is ready to do that? If I handed you a microphone, would you say, yup. I saw a couple hands go up, praise God. That's where we need to be in this. Especially in a world where the world is kind of crumbling around, does anybody say, no, it's not? The world is crumbling. There are, the lines are drawn. And the line is, are you with Jesus or are you with the world? Because Jesus wants everybody in the world to be with him. That's the beauty of it all. Whoever loses your life on the sake of Jesus will live forever. And that's what Jesus keeps saying. So you see, this whole thing that Jesus sent his disciples to, he knew that with nothing but fear, if they went out in trepidation, that they may just go, I don't want to do this anymore. And they would quit. And what Jesus is saying is, you're going to do this and do this and do this and do this. And if you know it up front, and the only thing that you should fear is God, then knowing those things should take fear away from you. With the only fear that you have is the fear of God. And you know, in Psalm 111, I believe it's 111 verse 10, it says, the... Um, 
fear is the beginning of all wisdom. When you start to fear, and what the, the, the psalmist meant was fearing God, your wisdom starts to expand. You start to understand what life is all about and what the world is trying to get you to do versus what God wants you to do. And Jesus spelled it out very simply, and I said it earlier, but I'm going to say it one more time. What Jesus wants us to do is go to the lost people of Ashland. <laughs> and what I mean by that is very simply, we have friends, we have neighbors that we may not even know, neighbors. We have people that live across town, but we live in the same town. We are able, because of that, to be able to con converse with people. And Jesus said, go and speak to people. And if you get along with that person, open it up. You know, I, I sit in my prayers sometimes in the morning, and I get really upset when I watch too much news the night before. And you wake up and you say, I, I wish I could, and forgive me, but maybe you say, I wish I could go to Congress and get in front of every last one of them and get the microphone and wham the gavel down and say, you're doing this wrong. But you know what? It would do no good because they already have what they're doing, and one little voice isn't going to make a difference. I hate to say it. However, one person, talking to one person, and they come together, and at some time in that conversation, it may be three weeks or three months later, all of a sudden God opens up an avenue to speak of Jesus, and all of a sudden that person goes, I get it. You know what? You just advanced you just advanced the kingdom. And that's what Jesus is saying here. There's all of this stuff around us that we can't get around, can't get away from. But we can work one on one. And that's what I always come to in my prayers. Is all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I'm right. I, I'm, I'm wrong, Jesus, and you're right. One person. I'm to help one person. And if every person helped one person, the world changes. It's that simple. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Our scripture today, Jesus is telling us how to overcome fear. Because fear is a great paralyzer. We need to stand up to it. We need to know that there may be a little pain for a little while. But there's great joy in eternity with what God gives us. Jesus' word brings conflict and division to us. It makes us choose one way or the other. We either follow the world or we're and being controlled by the world or we follow Jesus. And by following Jesus, by trusting his word, we're set free to be happy in our lives here and in the hereafter. You've seen people that have been um, bullied. You've seen people that, that are, are in prison. You've seen people that have these life-ending diseases and they're happy. Why? Because they know God is in control. And I hope we all know that. Sometimes I think we just need reminding. And these words today just really resonated in me that I needed to say some pretty strong words myself because Jesus told absolutely the truth. He says, you got to just get out there. Don't worry about being afraid. God's got your back. Talk to people. Tell the good news to people. Be kind and loving to everyone. And advance the kingdom. That's what we can take away from fear. Amen. I found these words for communion. But before I really start, um, just so you understand what we're doing, we have four trays. There will be four of us. We'll put masks on and we will come out and give you. But on each tray, there's only 10 or 12 cups. They're double cupped. So when you take one out, there are two cups. The bottom cup has a cracker in it. The top cup has the juice. <laughs> so you get them both in one shot. Uh, we have a trash can up here at the end of the service. You can throw your cups away too. So that way nobody's touched them. Everything will be nice and easy and we'll come by and we'll just uh, serve each one. So just take one off the tray. It's a double cup. And then we will take them both together. Alexander Campbell, um, one of the founders of Disciples, 
I found these words that, uh, and I thought it was an interesting way to start communion. It says, Upon the loaf and upon the cup of the Lord, in letters which speak not to the eye, but to the heart of every disciple, is inscribed, When this you see, remember me. Indeed, the Lord says to each disciple, When he receives the symbols into his hand, This is my body, broken for you. The loaf, the loaf is thus constituted a representation of his body, first whole, then wounded for our sins. And the cup is thus instituted a representation of his blood, once his own, but now poured out to cleanse us from our sins. It's good words. They're fine, true words. And I just felt it would be very appropriate just to read Paul's words from 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of, in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I will add the words that we have no fear in coming to this table, no fear of what the world has to offer us out there. The only f fear we have is the fear of the knowledge and the wisdom of our God. So we invite you to take these. In fact, let us distribute all of the items first, and then we will take them together. But we thought it would be nice, our closing hymn is, I'm going to live so God can use me. And you'll see that just substitute the words, I'm going to work, pray, and sing as we go through these. If you want to bounce around in your seat a little bit as we sing, whatever. But uh, what a glorious day. We thank you for coming out and worshiping with us.